Hello, uh, welcome to the Design Week Awards Hall of Fame. Uh, we're about to meet and talk to one of this year's two inductees. Uh, this person is an experienced designer with a highly experimental and radical approach to her work, known for her boundless imagination and ability to get complex projects off the ground that ask questions we didn't always know needed asking. Uh, maybe you've heard about how she founded the International Space Orchestra, made up of NASA scientists. They perform music inspired by space missions and have collaborated with the likes of Damon Albarn and Bobby Womack. Perhaps you've seen one of her films like Disaster Playground, which investigates if we're really prepared for an asteroid impact, or I Am Not a Monster, in which she looks at uh, for the origins of knowledge and asks why the likes of Trump and Le Pen are able to succeed by promoting past ideologies. She's also worked and collaborated with the likes of companies and organisations, including MoMA, Google, WeTransfer and Porsche. She is Nelly Benhayoun Stefanian, founder of Nelly Benhayoun Studios. Welcome to the Hall of Fame and congratulations. <laughs> thank you so much, Tom. Uh, thank you for the introduction as well. And of course, thank you for the recognition. It's always really exciting, you know. Um, now I can like dive and dig my own coffin after this one, you know, I think. <laughs> Oh, well, you're, you're very welcome. It's sort of thoroughly well deserved and, and recognised by um, everyone in our, our editorial team. And um, uh, yeah, you're in sort of very good company in there as well. Um, but um, so we'll get straight into it. Uh, and I wanted to sort of talk, uh, have a, a conversation around a few things to do with with education. And um, you yourself have had a very broad education. education um, and I didn't know until the other day that that includes a PhD in human geography and philosophy. Um, you also did the Design Interactions MA at RCA. Um, Reflecting on that, back in 2015, you told us that um, it was uh, a bit magical at the time. I was free to experiment and test out how to best tell stories and perform. This is where I started to think that design could work hand in hand with theatrical methodology and that designing experiences also meant thinking in terms of script performance, installation and architecture. Um, so th this is where you started to think about design experiences that could be performative. Um, is it fair to say that that's where your, your practice as we know it today kind of started to come together? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I would say that for me, it goes all the way back to, you know, where I come from. Um, so, you know, I'm brought up in the south of France, but from a family of immigrants. My mum is from Armenia, my dad from Algeria. Uh, my granddad was very much involved in politics. You know, he was, uh, as they arrive, as a lot of Armenians arrived from Syria and find their way into France, they actually started to set up, you know, textile companies and, you know, and it became kind of like at the time, the kind of the, the expertise that Armenian people will have, at least in the South of France. So I was kind of like surrounded by people that were in textile and making textile. But also my granddad realized that there was an opportunity to also shift people's mind because there was a lot of Armenian people at the time arriving in France. And so he thought that it would be a good place to be than to be in politics and to actually like, you know, basically try and make uh, some of the rights of that community kind of like known to you know the kind of the mainstream and so he started to get involved into politics find his way into becoming a general mayor and they eventually got the armenian genocide recognized in france so i was like brought up into that you know like going into the street protesting doing all of this work uh, and then eventually found myself going into textile myself so i did a ba in textile design i don't know if you know but that's mm -hmm. So I went into this school in Paris to study. I learned about textile, but then realized I needed to tell stories. And that's when I found out about uh, this course at the Royal College of Arts uh, called Design Interaction, which was led by uh, Tony Dunn and Fiona Rabi and a, a whole lot of like incredible teachers, you know, James Oge, Noam Toram, a lot of really uh, Nina Pop, lot of amazing amazing teacher and I was really and you're right in that um, you know I think a lot of the experiments started before that but at the same time I was given complete you know carte blanche to kind of like experiment with things and also learn you know and I think I learned so much in this course because also you know the the the, the kind of the network of people that were there were just so far different from each other in terms of their realm of expertise you know it was the first time where I was surrounded by people that came from digital backgrounds from like you know of course product design backgrounds of course from you know I would say experience design background like you know building user experience design kind of things but also people that were coming from sociology mathematics and all of us were put into the same you know course and it was about I think maybe 20 of us or maybe 15 of us I don't really fully uh, 
but it was kind of like really intense uh, two years of my life there. Um, and then from there, started to develop all of this NASA project and space project. Mm -hmm. Started to do a lot of theater um, and tried to bring that kind of theatrical uh, element into the work and the performance uh, side into the immersive experience I would design. Da -da 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 -da, you know, kind of like learning about working in pluridisciplinary team, all of these things. And then finding my way into, you know, doing a PhD in politics um, and political theory because I needed to understand how you can really shift people's mind, you know. Uh, and for me, it does come down as well to fully understanding, especially if you are interested in making change in institutions, to actually understand where are the power structures in these institutions, how do they come to play, why is there this systemic kind of reproduction of, you know, storylines or narrative or, you know, or for some cases racism, you know, how do you actually kind of address these and how do you identify them in the first place? And so for me, that kind of learning kind of like was put into hands with things like that. Yeah. But it's important, you know, it, it's just been like, if you look at, uh, if you look at this, like, and try to find a rational, then maybe I would say that to me, it's, um, it's actually very much the same way that I design anything I do. It's very nonlinear. You mm. know, I never looked for linearity. Uh, in anything I was doing. Uh, I don't believe that history has a beginning and an end. I don't believe that, you know, I believe that it's uh, an interjection of events uh, and all of them kind of playing to each other to actually build this kind of ecosystem that we inhabit. And so, you know, I kind of like pretty much design my kind of like trajectory the same way that I would do any um, projects or any installation or any, you know, any pitch really. Well, I'm, I'm glad you sort of talked about political agitation being something in your kind of family history and background as well as your education, because I think that will make sense to a lot of people as we as we kind of carry on and touch on some other projects. But um, sticking with education for now, I mean, you've, um, you've held lecturer and research positions at St. Martin's and you've been a visiting professor at the RCA and Architectural Association School of Architecture. Um, but you also set up the University of the Underground where you, you've offered a, a master's in the design of experiences. Um, it's very different to, to mainstream education. So uh, first of all, what drove you to do this? And also, um, how do you feel about mainstream educa design education in general? Um, is it broken? Does it need fixing? Like, why, why have you taken such a different perspective? Thank you, Tom, for the question. I mean, I think there is... Um... You know, there is a lot to change in many different fields, right? And education is one of them. I think, you know, um, again, like if you go back to, you know, if you go back to politics or if you look at the way that things have been set up by national states and the way that we are organized in most democracy is that government define the agenda for education and define the way that education is going to be sponsored, supported, you know, and, and so forth. And so as it happens in the UK, and you know that education is extremely expensive and specifically, you know, postgraduate education. So, you know, it can rank between, you know, 6K to like 17 grand, sometimes even 45 grand. Mm -hmm. And so of course, then it means that when it comes to this question about diversity and actually who are the people in the room, you realize really quickly that, you know, it's no rocket science there. You know, it's like ultimately, you have the same time of people getting into places of power because we just kind of like regenerate the same kind of like, um, you know, ownership of wealth. Uh, and that doesn't uh, rely on any form of redistribution in that sense. So for me, it was always essential to look at this idea of redistribution of wealth, uh, look at this idea of actually uh, an education that could go beyond, um, you know, governmental agenda that will be completely free and remote and decentralized from governmental agenda. Uh, and so to actually have this kind of nomadic uh, version so that if you happen to shift into a totalitarianism regime, uh, which we see, unfortunately, is the way that things go, you know, with like um, uh, uh, a resurgence of, you know, extreme right uh, ideas and fundamentals, uh, with this kind of like a return to these core ideas that you will have find during the Second World War, for example, then it's really important to start looking at, you know, decentralized model that actually could still exist and still teach and still support freedom of thinking outside of governmental um, kind of like a network and, spon and sponsoring, that makes sense. So that's how pretty much the University of the Underground was born. Uh, it comes from, you know, it's a free, 
pluralistic, transnational uh, charity and you know education platform uh, that is, as I mentioned, transnational because we exist beyond you know nation states. You can find us. We exist under uh, nightclubs. I mean, by the way, talking about nightclubs, this is my office. I don't know. We've not talked about this just yet. Yeah, yeah. Good, this good, is just a little kind of too, but we are, you know, if you look by the window, I don't know if you can see the window on the other yeah. side, but there is, yeah, yeah, down there is actually a nightclub called the Village Underground, which has been going on in London for more than 15 years now. Uh, and our office is just based on top of it, but the University of the Underground historically is always based in basement of nightclub, because I strongly believe that when it comes to innovation and new ways of thinking and decentralized model, a lot of the counterculture are actually born from nightlife. So we wanted to really be based within the core of the creation of this decentralized model, within the, the kind of the home of nightlife, which are nightclubs, and actually work with them so the students can actually test their toolkit, experiment with events, develop their immersive experiences, and actually work and co-create with nightlife and you know the community that go in nightclubs, basically. Mm. And so nightclubs are having like, a lot of time, so it's nice to... It's nice, but nightclubs are having quite a hard time at the moment, so it's nice to see uh, different uses for them as well. Yes, uh, exactly, and actually sources of funding as well. So yeah, so we so we rely on you know corporate uh, responsibility donation. Uh, hmm. We also you know individual donations, and so you know that's kind of like how we've been going on since 2017 now, uh, and we were also supported quite you know at the time by WeTransfer, which is the tech company that I used to work for for now a decade. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of like how we were uh, developed and we still are at this point. And the, and the teaching itself is a bit different maybe to what you might find at universities, traditional universities. Yeah, totally. I mean, I would say that a lot of our students as well go down to actually teach eventually. Uh, it's a very, um, you know, like, uh, it's a very flexible model. We evolve all the time. We always look for the feedback of our, you know, of our students and how they see it uh, develop or how they would like to kind of like see this curriculum fit within their schedule. You know, we started research program, so they are a bit shorter. Uh, but yeah, we are looking at starting a new MA. Oh, so right. it will also be free, completely free. What's so that's kind of like, yeah, that's... Is that in a new area, new discipline, maybe? I mean, it will be in design of experiences, which yes. naturally is like the idea of like modifying power structure through the mean of an event by the design of an event. Uh, and so looking at, you know, of course, from linguistics all the way to political theory to actually identify what and collaborate with an institution, you know, how do you do that? Uh, and also coming up with your own job role and your own financial scheme. You know, we teach a lot of economy as well, because I think too often, you know, in creative industry or creative teaching, we kind of fear from the fact that, you know, economy is not for us. We don't, but actually, if you're looking to actually build multiverses and kind of federation of care, you're going to need funding in some way. So you're going to need to know how to fundraise. You need to understand how, what, what sort of business model you want to kind of rely on, what you want to do that is different from what is there. How can you fit within the system, but so still exist outside of it so you can remain free to develop ideas. And all of this you know, all of this work is very much inspired as well by uh, the philosophy of someone that is quite key to a lot of the ideas that I preach, uh, which is called Anna Arendt, you know, and I made a movie, you mentioned it in the introduction called I'm Not a Monster, which anyone can see. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, I, it, anyone can see it actually on YouTube or Netflix. So it's like it's free of access, but it kind of like unraveled the philosophy of this political theorist Anna Arendt who died in 1975, I mean, I should really, but anyway, she survived the Holocaust and then she was actually, she wrote this book called The Origin of Totalitarianism. And she look at how important it is to develop platform for plurality, where many ideas coexist and where you support, you truly support freedom of thinking so that there is never a case where you have ideology run it all or you have an authoritarian regime basically. And that's kind of like what, yeah. my role has been uh, and what I do you know in the studio and what we do in the studio to actually build this uh, this pluralistic model where a lot of people can coexist uh, inhabit 
um, you know, kind of develop their own organized community and kind of like support each other. Yeah, well, let, let me pull a couple of things out from, from that. It's really interesting. So we've got, um, yeah, decentralizing power structures or maybe sort of traditional university education um, and uh, uh, pluralistic um, education. So look, thinking about, um, you know, not one way of thinking, but, but several. Um, and in the film, um, you kind of uh, saw some of those things through and, and in particular when you find it's streamed on Netflix, but you also um, released it on a record. And uh, I think you said at the time that you were interested in uh, kind of shaking those institutions up and decentralizing them and maybe thinking about the way that um, challenging the way that film and music industries think about distribution. What was what was the thinking there? Yes, so, you know, we released the movie as well on a record. I mean, I must have it there. I can actually show you. Since oh, we yeah. have a lot of props in this office, I might yeah. show you some stuff. But, you know, it's called I'm Not a Monster. I mean, this one is actually a bit of a... So, you know, as you go, you open it, you're going to, you know, I will sign it inside. I don't know if this one has got any signing, but usually I will kind of like write something in between there. Um, and then it, it comes in two parts and it's the entire movie, but basically put on two pieces of record. And what I was interested in was, uh, you know, I work a lot within the music industry, but I work a lot also within the film industry, the design industry, the politics, you know, space industry and so forth. And so for me, it's always been really fascinating to see how each of those, you know, function. So if you think about a band, like a famous band, like, I don't know, I'm just thinking about, you know, someone like, you know, say Radiohead, you know, you have like a scheme of like fans that will always turn up to their, you know, to their shows. And then on the, and they are like, you know, obviously really established as a band, right? And then on the other side of that, you have like, I would say more niche content, more experimental content, right? Which you find in films, but you also find in music. And what was inter of interest to me was to look at, you know, how and what are the kind of the model that, you know, bands like Radio had used to actually build this fan base and kind of tap into the music industry and the record label and the kind of the network that the record label have and actually make it benefit as well independent filmmaker. So if you have like in this case, uh, who did we work with? We work with a record label, which is based in New York, actually. And so we released the, the record with them together with the vinyl factory. And the idea was that the vinyl factory will say that people could go and get the records and signed and, you know, they will have this kind of added value to it. But at the same time, uh, you go, you get it for free when you go to see the, the film. So it suddenly is like the kind of the, the model that I was looking into was how can this music industry and the kind of the fan base kind of like, um, you know, I would say gig scheme where people mm -hmm. turn up to see a gig and so forth kind of benefit as well filling up uh, cinemas and filling up the room of cinemas for independent filmmaking and independent, you know, documentary. And so the idea was that if you come and get a ticket to go and see I'm Not a Monster, then you leave with a free record that has been also signed and so forth. And in this model, the two industry kind of like support each other in that sense. But you can also buy the record separately on the Vinyl Factory website or also just go, you know, and watch it on a, you know, I mean, on a streaming platform. But of course, when you watch it on a streaming platform, you don't get the free record in the sense. Yeah. So it was kind of interesting for me to kind of like play around with this, um, with these ideas. Um, and that's kind of like the way that I like to develop things in general. Yeah, no, that's definitely the kind of yeah, innovation those industries need. And I'm going to take you on something else now. So sort of bear with me on this one. Um, a, a lot of your work is, is kind of about imagining, like we were talking about, alternative futures or multiverses. Um, and you encourage your master's students from University of the Underground to engage in these pluralist, pluralistic methods. Um, you've also uh, worked with NASA to send music into space, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, but I always feel with your work that although you're working in a very abstract way, uh, and sometimes thinking about things which are kind of slightly out of reach and intangible, you're really trying to make people reflect on like their own um, humanity or their relationship with each other and the planet um, and think about the world they kind of want to be part of today. Um, so by thinking about alternative futures and multiverses, what does your work tell us about how we live our lives today and perhaps how we think about our futures individually and collectively? It's not all about these these things out there, is it? You're kind of asking, you're, you're uh, you're looking at people to kind of reflect on the present and maybe some other things, yeah. 
Totally. I mean, it's interesting that you're saying it's abstract because I think maybe when I talk about it, it's like it's talking about maybe big ideas. But actually, when you go through one of our installations, I'm going to, if I can share my screen, actually, can I? I don't know. Yeah, if go I can. For it. Um, you know, we, uh, I think you have to let me do that, but maybe we can do it later or you let me know if I can. But, uh, okay. you know, yeah, yeah. can I? Um I don't think we can do it right now because how we got the, the no. setup, but we can Maybe probably drop anyone... something in seamlessly. Yeah. Like I'm edit, sure someone, yeah. you know, I'm sure everyone will be able to like watch what we do, but like usually we will, you know, it's like it's an immersive experience. So you come through it, you will experience a sonic boom, or you will experience, you know, dark energy in your kitchen sink, or you have a volcano in eruption in your living room, or you have like a giant, you know, moon games like playground that is being built. But in all of these, or convoy, or you know. In all of these, the idea, or like, you know, we did a, an installation recently in Paris called, um, you know, Shiny Gold, where we were yeah. looking at sources of energy and members of the public were able to go and jump inside an intestine, came out of the intestine, find themselves with fungi, then find themselves talking to a sun and actually looking for uranium like Marie Curie did back in the day. So this idea of like having all of these sources of energy in the form of a playground. And I love that. Like... I would say that for me, it's actually quite mechanical, the way that I design experience so that, you know, even though there is big ideas and there is big concept behind it, and there is also a big collaboration with scientists, you know, sociologists, philosophers in general, there are is really large pluridisciplinary team. Yep. Then when it comes to the actual piece, like it's usually very playful. It's got a lot of humor. Uh, you know, I use a lot of relatable structure because, you know, again, it's kind of like making sense of like people's body going through these spaces as well, or tactile kind of material, textures, color palette, you know, all of this learning that I actually learned from textile design back in the days, you know, are very much finding their ways there. Uh, and it's actually something that um, is there to mechanically, I would say, build an element of thrill with member of the public. So when you come out of one of these experiences, you are shaken. You kind of wonder, what is this I just experienced? Uh, did I just like throw some microwave gun into my neighbor? Or did I just experience a sonic boom or a blast? Or what, what, what was this sound effect? What was this kind of like, what did I just touch there? So I'm looking for this kind of moment of questioning or critical thinking that comes after you come out of the of the space in general. Uh, and that is kind of like, in a way, the way the mechanics that we use, you know, in developing this, um, this expense, making sense of a lot of dramaturgy and a lot of the theater uh, learning, you know. And so what I'm hoping is like, in general, is that member of the public would kind of like leave these spaces thinking, okay, what, you know, actually, the sources of energy that come from the sun is in a way also quite similar to the one from potassium or from uranium or also i have energy inside my own body with you know my bacteria and my lungs and so or you know like that could be the starting point of them thinking about how all of these things are part of the same ecosystem and that to me is really what i i want to reach at the end of the day with each of these projects is to actually get member of the public to think uh, about this ecosystem, that they are all part of, of the same, you know, what happened uh, down in the universe is somewhat related to what's happening down into your, your guts and to your, your bacteria. This kind of idea that there is one scale that um, doesn't connect everything for me is completely unrealistic, because actually, if you get into physics and if you learn about physics, you start to realize that the scale uh, at which we are at is so massive that actually to be homocentric and just to think that we are at the center of the universe just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, no, it's maybe a foolish attempt for me to kind of try to neatly bring it all, all together because yeah. it's obviously different for each project. And like you said, lots of your projects are very, very tangible indeed. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely leave off with a sense of kind of like questioning things about myself, my relationship with other people or the universe in general or whatever it is you might happen to be focusing on. Um, but that's really interesting for that, that insight, thanks. Um, we haven't got too much time left, but I wanted to um, ask you to kind of appeal to younger designers who who might be into your work and like if they were to to try and follow in your your footsteps. As we said right right at the top, you've got a, a very sort of varied background in education. But um, yeah, for people who want to um, design experiences um, and uh, maybe they're doing a different design course and they might want to sh shift slightly, 
um, what would you recommend? Um, well, so I would say that it's important for them to start building their partners in crime, I call them. So the partners in crime are in a way, you know, their peers or people that they that they admire or mentor or you know people that they think are doing really interesting practices you know and to try and interrogate uh, for themselves why is it that these people are doing work that is interesting to them uh, and so to actually start building this kind of like map of you know humans that kind of do interesting practice have developed interesting job for themselves and kind of like learn from that but also start to connect with each of them so they can either you know mentor them or like maybe have some chat with them or to try and like actually support them as well especially when you know when you progress and you have key decision to make like you know shall i go in mathematics or shall i go in you know design or shall i go in you know or whatever and when you're not sure as to how you should do your next move or your next step or, you know, what you do with such and such client project or whatever, it's really important to rely on your mentors. Uh, and I found that to be always really uh, helpful, you know, like I think, and they can who, be both. Who are your, your mentors, who are your, mentors and your, uh, your partners in crime? Well, I guess it's like for me, they're both dead and alive. You know, I think there is people that are great aspiration to me. Like, for example, people like Sunra, you know, is a jazz musician, but like someone that kind of like defy any kind of form of categorization, you know, was very much, um, you know, I would say both like a orchestrator, but also someone that was kind of looking for a new genre and a new form of aesthetics to the level, you know. So it's like a musician, but he's obviously dead, you know. Uh, people yeah. like Anna Arendt, uh, you know, people also that I take great inspiration from, you know, like the political theories that I mentioned to you just a second, you know, when I was talking about pluralistic thinking. And, you know, there is also people like, um, you know, who else that I, I think, like Marie Curie, for example, I love Marie Curie. I'm like, look, I even have a, like, look, I have even like a little postcard of Marie Curie. So Marie Curie, who yeah. found uranium with her husband, Pierre Curie. And I yeah. think what a lot of people don't know is that uh, Marie Curie, at one point of her life, could have become a really, really rich woman, you know, because she found uranium, which now is being used for any form of x-rays all, all around the world. And you know, she was asked whether or not she was going to share the IP and the way to actually like figure whether, you know, how to make x-rays basically and uranium, you know, kind of research. And her and her husband decided that uh, they didn't want to uh, put a, a IP on their discovery. They actually wanted to be completely open so anyone out there could actually develop the practice yeah. so that nowadays we actually have found, you know, ways to actually identify when there is cancer cell and so forth. And that's because she made that kind of decision, you know, and that to me is really inspiring. So I love to like look at uh, history like that because, sorry, <laughs> because sorry. it really helped me to make decisions sometimes, you know, like uh, sometimes in the work, I think like, oh, I want to keep owning this thing. And I think this idea of ownership and IP is really is a, a massive burden, um, mm. especially in the way I think about things, you know, yeah, yeah. where... I'd like to think that we need to start going and building beyond capitalism, but like this entire capitalistic system rely on the idea of ownership, right? So all of these kind of like concepts that are actually economical concepts, um, they need to be interrogated and they need to be questions. And perhaps that's where, you know, new decentralized model can come from. But like, that's kind of like what I'm excited about, but that's, I'm only spoken about, about dead people. Obviously, people that are alive, you know, of course, my teacher, you know, like I would say Tony Dunn, of course, Fiona Rabi, uh, Susan Lee from Biofabricate, uh, who has been an amazing mentor of mine. Uh, Susan Lee, who um, has been pretty much, you know, looking at, you know, new biodegradable, you know, a new system of thinking around the fashion industry so that you can build a sustainable kind of model, uh, you know, using bacteria as a means to actually like build the next form of textile, for example, completely by, you know, and that to me is like, and she's always like thinking beyond this kind of like um, way of functioning, you know, in terms of like copyrights and, you know, and, and in terms of like uh, ownership, sense of ownership, so that you can kind of like really change the way that um, global warming is kind of like set 
to go on about. There is, of course, people like Majid Majid, the Lord Mayor of Sheffield, former Lord Mayor of Sheffield, which I'm lucky enough now to be working with. Uh, there is a lot of people that actually in my film, I'm Not a Monster, are uh, very much of great inspiration. People like Dr. Frank Marches, who is a scientist, uh, Frank Drake, Jill Tarter, um, you know, I mean, I can keep on going. Pussy Riot, yeah. Nadia, uh, you know, Noam Chomsky, like, you know, the lead Lots of, lots of uh, lots You of know, the end comments, um, like Arjuna Padurai, like, you know. And, lo and, lo and lots of those are in the film, like you say. But yeah, I love the, the Marie Curie um, story. Uh, ben <laughs> yeah, open source before it was before it was a thing. Um, right, uh, I've, we've kind of running out of time, but... Um, uh, we talked. You're talking about collaboration then, but I just wanted to ask you one more question because uh, famously you do like to to collaborate uh, and you like to think big. So, do you have a sort of dream project or or maybe a subject if you don't want to give us too much information that you're you're particularly interested in exploring um, and who you might like to collaborate with? Is there anything on the horizon or or in the depths of your mind that you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, actually, I was kind of eating a pun just a second ago, but like economics for me is uh, the big thing, you know, it's like the next big thing as at least that I want to get into mm. might mean that I need to have a degree so I can fully understand and grasp uh, at least some of the linguistic of it. But I would say that we are definitely going to be running like a program at the University of the Underground on economics, because I think you know, ultimately, if you want to start questioning the way that things are being done, and so if you want to actually really build the centralized model, then you need to start like looking at, like I mentioned, you know, ownership model, you need to start looking into, you know, obviously what has made that capitalism is still going on, you know, for the past, like, you know, since the industrial revolution for like now more than like 70 years, right? Like, how can we start building a new model that is actually going to support new alternative uh, functionings? That to me, much more respond to the way I function, which is much more elastic and much more fluid and much more, you know, like to do with the multiverse and the way that, you know, the uh, the physics are built. So for me, this is where I'm interested in bringing, you know, this kind of world together, the world of quantum physics and physics with the world of economics and the world of design so that, you know, us and of course, as designer, we have this you know, um, I would say experience of building things from nothing and from scratch, but also to understand systems and the way that they are being built and constructed. And so it's um, it's where I would like to kind of like find myself next, maybe become the Ministry of, uh, you know, of Economics or run the country, who knows? Well, there you and go. Something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love, love to hear more about that, that program at least, or maybe your plans to run the country. Um... But, um, yeah, but uh, if I run it, I would probably run the next revolution in this place, you know. <laughs> yeah, shake, shake things up. Activate bit. the Federation of Care, build up all of the networks, get all of the organized community to kind of like get into action. That's what I'm about. <laughs> and de and decentralize everything. Yeah, it sounds it sounds great. Yeah, uh, uh, we'll we'll have a chat with you about that if you if you get it when you get it off the ground. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for for your time and like. Uh, we haven't chatted for long, but hopefully that gives people a bit of an insight in, into your work and what you're all about. Um, yeah, I certainly uh, learned a lot. But um, yeah, um, right. I will. Uh, I will congratulate you once again. Uh, Thank you so much. To the fame, um, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.